that's right. Take it easy, take it easy. It is 5.08 in the afternoon, and I am here with Bob Merritt. He is vying for District 13 seat, which will, of course, be uh, Representative Gene Pinson's seat, who is not seeking re-election. He is running as a Democrat here. He has uh, worked extensively with... Uh, Senator John Drummond, and he's had quite a background in government, that's right, he is a lawyer here in Greenwood. Welcome to the show today, Robert Merritt. Good to be with you. It's good to have you here today. So, um, gosh, where, where, where are you from originally? I was born in North Carolina, but I grew up in Berkeley County at a fire tower. In a fire tower? In a fire tower in Oakley, South Carolina. What do you mean by a fire tower, Bob? By a, a, a South Carolina Forestry Commission fire tower where my mom would carry me up into the tower. I was actually homeschooled until I went to first grade. Mom homeschooled me in the fire tower. She carried me up every day, and, and, and I was reading before I went to school. That was a good thing. It was a very good thing. I, it's wonderful memories. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you look at education today, and uh, I know education is one of the issues that you are very interested in, um, being able to read, they say if you don't have it down good by the time you're in the third grade, you might as well almost hang it up. And I believe that's true. I think that that's a, uh, read, reading is a gift that can, uh, that, that keeps on giving. If you just can't uh, un understand basic uh, paperwork, you just can't function in this world. And I think that's an emphasis that we need to you know, really uh, emphasize in education. Absolutely. Now we'll get into talking more about education in a little bit, but uh, so you grew up there, and when you were a young teenager, what did you want to be in the world? Um, I guess I want to be President of the United States. Oh, geez. <laughs> How about now? Um, no, thank you. I'll stay out of Washington politics completely. Um, we have our hands full here on the local level and in, and in the state house. Exactly. But uh, you really wanted to be the president? I was very, uh, very, very very political minded back in those days. You were political minded. I found it, you told me a story about uh, Richard Nixon in the fourth grade. I was a Richard Nixon man, uh, which went against, uh, went against the grain in South Carolina in uh, 1960 uh, as a Republican candidate, but I was very, uh, I, was, I was very passionate about Richard Nixon. Why? As a fourth grader, wasn't didn't kids wonder why are you so into Richard well, Nixon? Actually, our my, I guess my fourth grade class was pretty political because we were pretty well split with Kennedy and uh, uh, Nixon. I think the uh, news media had the uh, he visited Venezuela, mm -hmm. Caracas, Venezuela, and was uh, his uh, limousine was attacked by communists, and I guess that kind of got my interest peaked. That. You know, this thing, communist and capitalism and democracy is uh, really, it, it is a battle. And uh, we, Richard Nixon, I thought he handled it. I kind of admire him for that. You know, that had to go back to uh, maybe good civics class. It is very good civics class. I can still remember the uh, picture in the Post and Courier. <laughs> you know, that is amazing because I do, today in schools we don't teach a lot of civics. I mean, they have a civics block, but it's not as maybe intense as you would think it would be for today's world. And it's, uh, and it's a shame because I believe when you're, uh, you're you, in, in those days we were less distracted maybe. Mm -hmm. we, had, we didn't have the Xbox or the PlayStation to go to and uh, we would read the newspaper, not just the comic strips or the sports section. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would watch the news, Walter Cronkite, we'd watch, we'd, we'd, we'd watch the uh, newsmen that we trusted. Right. Uh, we'd watch Vietnam un unfolding before our eyes. You know uh, the uh, Tet Offensive. They, sure. Issues like this that, that would, um, you know, be on the news. We'd sit down with the family and watch the news together. Um, I had a brother that was in Vietnam, and uh, we were all concerned and praying for his safety and well-being and, and safe return home. Absolutely, but I think that uh, I think that I think there is something to be said for understanding government and civics is the way to uh, to get to that understanding. Civics is probably the Rodney Danger field of. Uh, Academics. Um, it, it's what do you mean by that? Now? <laughs> it, it, it gets no respect. Everybody thinks that uh, you know the uh, oh well, well we know how this goes. We know how this goes. Someone the other day had mentioned uh, that, that a certain bill had been passed uh, in in Washington that was a uh, uh, and and, I, and I'm a Second Amendment Democrat by the way. Um, that was uh, they said it was anti-guns, and uh, they said President Obama had, had signed the uh, anti-gun bill. 
And I asked him, I said, well, how did it get to his desk? And uh, he said, what do you mean? I said, you remember Schoolhouse Rock? I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. It's, it has to go through the House, and it has to go through the Senate. So we need to put blame equally. If there's an anti-gun law signed into effect, then we need to share blame with the House and the, and the Senate. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we we've, we've got to get our kids more educated. We've got to have more of an understanding. Part of the reason I do this show and, and try to have all our candidates on is simply so that everybody can make informed decisions. I think one of the worst things is for somebody to go to the ballot and not just pull the name because they saw the name on a on a placard or they have no idea who they're voting for. Well, I I I'll laughingly say it, but you know you have Star Wars and now during election season we have sign wars. Right. Who's got the you know biggest signs? Who's got the most signs? Um, I'm wondering who's going to, is 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 this stop sign going to make a difference uh, in endorsing certain candidates? You mm -hmm. pull up to a stop sign, you have 10, 15 signs out there. I want to see good. Honest, open debates with the candidates. So do I, we have right right now. We are getting into, in my opinion, we're getting to where we have government by sound bites. Mm -hmm. A politician will tell you, uh, "I'm a fiscal conservative." Well, give me your definition of fiscal conservative and show me where you are a fiscal conservative. Um, I am uh, uh, pro military. I'm pro defense. I'm uh, you know I'm I'm pro uh, elderly. I'm pro education. Then 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 show us. Don't don't just you know tell us. We want to see actions, not just the words. Absolutely. Now, of course, you started out. I think I read that you were the first rookie policeman in the Charleston uh, Police Department. North Charleston Police Department in 1973. I graduated with a, a bachelor's in secondary education from the University of South Carolina, and I was going to be a school teacher. Mm -hmm. I applied uh, uh, for the North Charleston Police Department, and lo and behold, I was hired. Now, back then, uh, uh, college educated. Uh, or a college graduate on the police department was an oddity, and uh, <laughs> it, and and you know, the next thing we knew, the newspapers coming around, it was myself and one other, fell or three other guys, and uh, we were being interviewed because why would we want to go into law enforcement with a college degree? Mm -hmm. And you know, simple answer to that is, it's wonderful calling, uh, probably one of the best jobs I ever had, one of the most enjoyable and full fulfilling jobs I've ever had. What did you get out? Of, what did you get out of it? I got out of the, uh, it's, 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 it's just ability to help people. You know, it's, it's kind of, of uh, it, it's rewarding whenever somebody calls and says, I need help. Uh, can you help me? You know, and you, and, 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 and you go in there and you distinguish this, this the good guys and the bad guys. Sure. And you're, um, you know, you're, 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 you're thinking that uh, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to make today somebody's going to be better off because of something that I did. What would you think about being a police officer today? Today would be a totally different, uh, different uh, atmosphere. The um, technology could be a uh, can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And I think, to a large degree, technology has made it a little bit tougher uh, on uh, for, for, for law enforcement. I think it's made it tougher on uh, attorneys. Um, and you are an attorney. And I am. And I am an Speaking attorney. Speaking from a full disclosure <laughs> here today, he is an attorney, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, I, I, I believe that both of us, law enforcement and the legal community, mm -hmm. we have to remember the first, you know, first and foremost is the United States Constitution. That's those, those were brilliant men who composed it. The Bill of Rights didn't happen by accident. We will never see the likes of those type leaders again, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, we all should, should, should be going toward the same the, the same goal, strengthening the Constitution, assuring the freedom and liberty that our founding fathers wanted us all to have. So as a Democrat, you believe that the Constitution should be as it is? I believe the Constitution is a living, breathing document that, the, that, that, that our forefathers uh, fashioned in a, in, a, in, in, in a way to adapt to the uh, changing times. Um, I am a, so you're say, not a strict... And this is what the Constitution says, and this is what we should do. Certain bill, certain certain issues, I am. Okay. Strict instructions on. Okay. I think the Second Amendment says that we have the right to bear arms, mm -hmm. and I think the populace does have the right to bear arms. Um, I'm a member of the NRA. Mm -hmm. I, I love to uh, take take my son and, and, and target practice. I it's a uh, I, the Second Amendment to me is so precious that I 
uh, probably I'm, I'm, I'm out of step with the, the majority of people who would say they're Democrats. Mm -hmm. Because I think once you start restricting your gun rights, then you're there, you're, you're going down a slippery slope that uh, may lead to more gun control. We may have more than we ask for. And so I'm, I'm second amendment, I'm pretty tight on it. I'm pretty tough on it. Then how do you feel about um, Obamacare? And, and how do you feel about, about that? Because a lot of people have said that, that if that stays intact, the mandate stays intact, then where will that lead? And I believe that the Obamacare has not been debated and discussed as much as it should have been. Okay. I believe that we have a lot of people out here, and I'll be the first one to tell you. Um, I'm not an expert on Obamacare. Okay. I do not like uh, mandates being passed on from governments to uh, business or other states without full and open disclosure. I think something may sound good, but when you put it into practice, it may not be as good. But there are people out here, and, and we all know, mm -hmm. who are worried day to day if they're going to have a job tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We have people out here day to day who are worried about the health care that they're going to, are they going to be able to afford it if they need it. And, uh, and I, I'll just give you a, a here's, here's, here's just one incident when I was at uh, one police department that sticks in my mind. It's, it, it's, it's tragic. I had a call to go to a sick person uh, in, uh, in, in a poor part of town. I went there, knocked on the door, and no one answered. I went in the house. The house had an awful stench. Cats running all over the place. This old man was laying in bed, and I said, are you okay? He said, and he pointed at his leg. And I pulled his leg back, and there were um, larvae. And I'll say the word, there were maggots falling out of his leg. Oh my God. He was being eaten alive. He had been to the hospital. He was diabetic. He was blind. Had no one to take care of him. They sent him home and told him to change that bandage twice a day, put on the salve twice a day. Mm -hmm. This old man had burned his leg because he was making some hot tea, and he didn't have any feeling in his leg. The hot water scalded him, and it became infected. I called the ambulance. They amputated his leg up to as far as it could, and he died three days later. And that sticks in my heart as far as, you know, we, we have got to help people like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what answers right. Obamacare or if it's uh, something, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, but we've got to see that people do not die under those conditions. We've got to, man we, we, we've got to take what we have and make it better, but, but we just can't leave people out there like that. They cannot take care of themselves, send them home, and what he did, die, because he cannot afford to stay in the hospital. Well, do you agree that in most instances, a lot of instances that we have had care for those, and particularly we have so many free clinics and whatnot jumping up now to try to combat that type of thing. And I believe that, and 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 I believe we're on the right path, uh, right path with that. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we have also the uh, what, what I what I like to do is see more volunteers out there. Mm -hmm. Lawyers have something called pro bono, right. where they go out and they represent people pro bono without compensation because that's part of the public good that they should do it. Right. And uh, and I believe the doctors should, should, should have the same obligation. I believe nurses should have the same obligation. I believe that people elderly staying home by themselves. You know, I we, we are such a loving, giving people by nature that we do not want to see an old person. We don't want to see a person, an, an invalid, being home alone, not having their basic needs met. And if there's volunteer programs that we could institute, we could follow up and try to help these people out. Uh, but should that come from the government level, from the from the federal government, or should that be something insti instituted on a state or local level, or should it be community by community? My, and I don't want to get religious on it, but my Lord and Savior says I have an obligation to help the less fortunate. Okay. Feed the widow, feed the poor, I help the poor, the sure. visit the prisoners. The government has an obligation. But they, they, it's not their sole obligation. I still believe that the volunteer community, I believe that, and, and, and I think that that government is best which governs closest to the people. Mm -hmm. I agree. That, that they're, they're the ones who understand what their needs are. Sure. And if there's well, a way. Actually, the churches, that used to be their, a large part of their role. And, and churches have, have uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, churches have, have backed down to that, what I call the social gospel where you go out and, and, and you feed the hungry and you clothe the, the poor and, and, and I would love to see churches step up to the plate. Um, 
Well, Can we you? have organizations, though, too, though, Bob. I mean, like we have the Soup Kitchen. Exactly. We have the Food exactly. Bank. We have United Ministries. And they do uh, a wonderful Community job. Initiatives has their clinic. So we have a lot. Now, maybe there needs to be more, but um, I, I think the real issue is just the actual mandate. Should we all have to buy health care? If uh, take all the rest of it aside, should we all have to buy health care? Um, because, as you said on an earlier issue, where will that lead? If the NR, if the uh, Second Amendment is taking away guns, then where will that lead? There, well, can you not apply the same thing to to the uh, uh, the mandate for health care? And and I can see your point. And the reason I say I can see your point is, as managing partner of the firm I'm with, whenever we pay the uh, federal government and the state government, um, it's a large chunk mm -hmm. of what your uh, profit or overhead, you know, needs to be covered. Um, I believe there's there 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 has to be some middle ground. Mm -hmm. There has to be, a, it, but but it has to be debated. Mm -hmm. It has to be a, uh, discussed. It can't be an emotional issue. It can't be. Uh, uh, well, if I remember right, Nancy Pelosi said we needed to pass this and then go back and read about it. Nancy Pelosi is not my one of my uh, role models. <laughs> okay, I was just checking that out. Okay, we found that out here today, folks. Because <laughs> I, I, I always, I, you know, anytime you talk about anything in government, that's one of those phrases that just comes back. And, you know, I wonder, I just wonder, uh, Nancy Pelosi, does she ever sit down and think, well, darn it, why did I say that? Now, and and, and Anne, I, I, I want to clarify this also. Um, I consider myself a Southern Democrat. Right. And a Southern Democrat has a heart and he's physical conservative. Mm -hmm. um, well, there were lots of them. There were lots of them, what, 20 years ago? Would I be about correct in, in saying in, that? In, in prosperous times. Yeah. And um, they, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a uh, totally different, a South Carolina Democrat is totally different from a national perspective. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I, 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 I want to make sure I'm not allowing somebody else to define me based on what sure. they see in Washington. Sure. Um, I disagree with a lot that goes on in Washington. Um, and, I'm, and, and, I, as, and, and I'll tell you that during this campaign, I'll probably uh, anger, aggravate as many Democrats as I anger, aggravate the Republicans. Uh, I believe this race will be uh, determined by the independents out there. I think this race will, will, will be determined by people who actually sit down, look at the candidates and say, is he going to be able to do what he's saying? Is that what I agree with? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, I, I'm, 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 I'm not a big, uh, I, I wouldn't call myself a uh, Nancy Pelosi fan. Or no, I, mean, I, I wasn't, but, but the mandate part is the part, in, and just like you are a uh, Second Amendment Democrat there, then that seems kind of like that kind of goes along with the fact that we shouldn't start down the road of mandating that we, people have to buy insurance. It has, Obamacare, or uh, whatever they want to call it, mm -hmm. has not, to, in, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is like a lot of laws. Nobody knows what's in it. Right. I keep hearing it's uh, thousands of pages. That, that, that if you look at this and, and, and you look at that, mm -hmm. until everybody's clear, I would never vote on anything. I, I would say I'm, I'd support anything until I know what's in it. Yeah. And and unfortunately, uh, I imagine there are very few congressmen who have taken the time to read what's called Obamacare. Absolutely. Well, that's just an interesting aside to talk yeah. about. To yeah. talk about um, where 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 we stand as we look at the issues. Of course, you are running for a state, a uh, state house, and you you uh, want to be in the state. Now, when you were trying to make up your mind what to run for, what made you decide to work to want to run for state representative? Um, Gene Pinson. I I I've always thought a lot of uh, of Gene. When I was with Senator Drummond, we all our, our delegation, the Greenwood delegation, was always working together, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we'd find out what the House was thinking, what the House priorities were. They look out for the Senate. We had Marion Carnell down there at the same time, um, and and Ann Parks, and it, it, it's, it's like we we worked together. Um, I like the House. I think uh, it, it, it's a smaller district. You can be closer to the people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the House is primed for someone to go in who's not going to march, uh, walk the party line. Somebody who's going to actually stand up and, 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 and say, this is wrong. Now, they may sit me down, right? you know, and that's fine. 
but somebody who's going to actually stand up and say what he feels is best for his people back home, regardless. I mean, take, take Republican, Democrat off the table. Um, I found out, it's, 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 it's been my experience lately, that, that, the, uh, that both parties are to blame for trying to marginalize the, uh, quote, Tea Party, mm -hmm. because the, the I actually like to sit down and listen to people because I learned it's learned something every time I talk to somebody, and I have a friend of mine that's very good. I mean, he's top of the line Tea Party person, and, and 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 I will tell you that if you sit down and you listen with an open mind, we'll never see eye to eye on everything. Sure, but they have some very good valid points that they're making, but it seems that the people want to marginalize them because that keeps the uh, two-party system in there. I think this thing where um, the, the candidates being disqualified mm -hmm. is the worst assault on democracy that I've experienced in my lifetime. I think you're right. It, 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 was, it was totally avoidable. We should have gone in and, and, and uh, straightened it out mm -hmm. and put these people back on the ballot. Sure. It was just wrong. Absolutely. I, I, I agree with you because we certainly cut the field. Those that were still in the field, I think, are glad that they, the others are out. But as uh, looking at the total picture, it certainly was wrong. It's horrible. Absolutely. Well, let's see. We have um, we have a call in here. Robert Lake, 74 today. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> uh, what has happened to Hubert Humphrey Democrats of 30 to 40 years ago? They were fiscal conservatives. They, they, they were fiscal conservatives and not been... And Again, I believe the uh, on the state level, I believe you still have fiscally conservative Democrats. Um, I believe that you still have the. Uh, uh, when you talk about Hubert Humphrey, I, uh, the happy warrior, mm -hmm. always out just just trying to do his best for his people out there, trying right. to look out for the uh, what, what what he considered those who could not look out for themselves. Um, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Uh, I, I wish well, there were more. Yeah, sure. And it, it seems that um, maybe, maybe we're talking more on the on the uh, federal level, but there definitely seems to be a hard left and a hard right. Right. And there doesn't seem to be many in the close to the center. Right. You got exactly right. And that that is particularly a problem. Well, that's Barry Goldwater. Where 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 is your Barry Goldwater Republicans now? Yeah. You know, I was I, I in '64. I I thought Barry Goldwater was one. A U H two O, yeah, you know, and um, he's turned out to be the. Uh, I don't know if, whether he'd be welcome in the Republican Party now. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. as we as we look at these things, you of course are looking at the state level. You know, we've got a lot of questions. We've got a lot of questions. A lot of things have been happening this last year in in the House down there. Uh, you were, of course, part of the Budget and Control Board. You worked with that some, didn't I did. you? I did Absolutely. Too. I want to get into that, and I want to get into some other issues here. So I hope you're going to stay tuned right here with us. I've got uh, Bob, Robert Merritt, right here with us. He is an attorney here in Greenwood. He is running for District 13, right down there, House of Representatives. Why don't you stay right here? Got a question? Give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. We'll be back after this word from our sponsors. Um, are you a pirate or a pack rat? Do you have a vacation of a lifetime sitting in the attic? Or a college tuition hung on a wall? Or is a fabulous retirement hidden in your jewelry box? Bring those items to Sharp Facets Gallery. We can establish value and buy from you or sell for you. And so ends another chapter at Sharp Facets Gallery. 72 Bypass and on the web, sharpfacets.com. Oh, I wish I could take it easy, but I'm interviewing here today, having a, having a spirited conversation with Robert Merritt. He is running for House District 13. That's right, uh, Gene Pinson is not going back, so we have uh, quite a field working on that. Uh, Robert is running as a Democrat. He actually is unopposed in the primary, but he wanted the opportunity to come on and talk to us today, so we're talking to him. But he will be the candidate in November. Um, so we are here talking. We just had another call come in. Hey, if you've got a question, give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. We just had a call from Florence Wallace. She says uh, the new... 
new age, new new Democrats, your problem, where are they? Your problem is what the national perception of Democrats are and uh, not the conservative, fiscally responsible Democrats. And I, and I agree with her totally. I, 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 the uh, um, state level Democrat mm -hmm. is, is, has, has always been uh, by, by tradition uh, uh, fiscal conservative, Cares, or tries to provide for the less fortunate, and uh, you know, even, although on the state level, I, we, it's not military, but we've always been very military uh, support, supportive of, of, of the military. You know, one of, one of my things, though, Robert, is uh, you know, I think it's one thing to help the less fortunate; it's another thing to hand out, hand out, hand out, and make those that should be standing up. I agree in helping people in any way to make them. Uh, uh, capable of putting food on their own table, taking care of themselves, but we do seem to have a society that seems to feel entitled. So, what do you say to that? I, 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 I disagree with the sense of entitlement to anything. Um, but we do, do you, we do well, have I, that problem. I, I think we have a society that is that that that, that is becoming uh, they're developing feelings of entitlement and the uh, and and offended if they don't receive the entitlement. Um, How are we going to break that? I think somebody we're going to have to. It, it's going to take strong leadership, and it's going to take it. It, it can't. It didn't develop overnight, mm -hmm. and it's not going to be able to be addressed overnight. But 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 someone's got to step up to the plate and start the process. And, Do you think uh, we have here in the state? Do, Do you think we have here in the state? Under uh, Governor Haley has uh, come on pretty strong. What do you feel about how Governor Haley has started to manage these issues? Um. I'm going to go back until she gets through her ethics uh, issues, mm -hmm. and uh, until she starts practicing transparency that she advocates for everyone else. Mm -hmm. Un until the, uh, uh, I would say the the cloud of ethical violation concerning her uh, employment and lobbying activities mm -hmm. is cleared. I don't I, I don't uh, see her being a, being the effective leader to move us forward. Okay, those issues have got to be addressed, and. Uh, well, on the state level, where where does the addressing come from? Where from what point was it starting at the governor? Well, you know I mean, does I, it have if, to start if, there? If I was, if if the uh, if I had ethical, if I was accused of these ethical violations that she's been accused of, mm -hmm. I would welcome an investigation. Mm -hmm. I would do everything I could to to assist in the investigation. I would want to clear the air. I wouldn't want anybody walking around saying Bob Mayer's trying to stonewall this or or he's not you know coming clean. Sure. And I think that's the perception that, that, that she's given out there. Um, I think the uh, adversarial role that they apparently enjoy between the Senate and the House and the governor um, is not helping anybody in this state. Okay. I think people outside look at that and they say, you know, the governor is, is, is having an a argument with the Speaker of the House and uh, having a, a there, there's threats with the House Ethics Committee, and then you've got the Senate saying, uh, senators calling her names and uh, un unbecoming names. They, so you think they're becoming ineffectual? I think they're becoming ineffectual, I, and I think it may—I I wouldn't say by design, mm -hmm. but but if they can't do anything, then what can you be blamed for? <laughs> well, there's an interesting idea, right? Well, okay. it, it, it's it's a uh, it's, it, it's that finger pointing, you know, it's that finger pointing. You got three pointing back at back, back at you. That that's why I keep saying this partisan. We we've got to cut this partisan. Uh, we, we, we've got to stop this partisan stuff. We've got to sit down and actually talk to each other. We've got to actually work together. If we're not doing any good, if, if, if we're not going to die as a Democrat or Republican. Mm -hmm. We're going to die as American, hopefully. That's our first. Then we South Carolinians, you know. And and you know, though there are those of us who bear the label Christian, um, but we've got to start working together. We've got to start talking to each other. We've got to start listening to each other. And we gotta have to we have to start doing what's best for the people, and quit this it's partisan bickering. It's like a bunch of kids arguing over over something. And we've got to demand better of our elected officials. We've got to sit here. I've, I've talked about this before. This government by soundbite. We've got to stop this government by soundbite. Show me why you're a fiscal conservative. Show me why you're going to help the elderly. Show me how you're going to help local government. Show me how you're going to respect local government. Show me how you're going to. Uh, bring these people into the system as part of the solution, not the problem. You know, it's, we, we, it's, it's just uh, we've got to demand more of our elected officials on all levels.
On all levels, I agree. I agree. So as we talk about this, um, you know, one of the things I know you wanted to talk about was in government was efficiency and the spending. And of course, I don't think we really attacked this year, which I thought it, we would be attacking, was uh, redoing the uh, tax system here in the state. I think they made a few little nibbles on it, but I don't think we really sat down and uh, and got a new hose. And I, I'll, I'm, I'm, now I am I'm glad that you brought that up. Okay. This is a tax realignment commission. Right. They, they, I could not tell you how many blue ribbon panel studies have been done on our tax reform. And I guess you can say that as an authority? I can say it as an authority because I've seen it and been involved in it. The, how many um, years have we been working on this? Oh, my goodness. If, if you how really, long have you been? Where were you in the, we in the state on, government? We worked on at least 20 years when I was... Twenty years. Twenty years when I was there, and then this this, this other this, this new tax reform just came out. Um, we've got to have politicians with backbones to do more than just do a study and pat themselves on the back and issue a report. I'll give you a prime example of of these blue blue ribbon panel studies. Uh, nineteen, I believe, nineteen ninety two, South Carolina Advisory Commission on Intergovernmental Intergovernmental Relations. Dan Mackey was the chairman or was the uh, director of it held a study on the infrastructure needs of South Carolina. It was called our crumbling infrastructure. Um, uh, Billy Bone was the co-chairman. I think John Corson was the co-chairman. And uh, they issued a, they, Wilbur Smith and Associates was hired to come in and engineer, do engineering studies. Clemson universities were all in, involved in this comprehensive plan to look at South Carolina. I guess they didn't do this as an intern project or something. They no. probably cost us, right? I would, I would assume it was something. <laughs> but, um, we end up, when the report was issued, it, in 1992 it said that it would cost South Carolina $60 billion to start addressing our crumbling infrastructure. Bridges, roads, railroads, uh, water, sewer, and, it, and you know what was done with the report, Ann? They shredded it? They, <laughs> they took it, they congratulated each other on the great work that was done, and it was put on the shelf. Put on the shelf. Okay. <laughs> Nothing was ever done with it. That's why and where are we at today? Our infrastructure is getting worse, worse and worse. The infrastructure is getting worse and worse. And I don't believe that. I, 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 I pray that there will be the political back, backbone to start addressing it, if, even if it's in, incrementally. Mm -hmm. you know, now, we did establish an infrastructure bank board to start loaning money for road paving projects to try to help uh, Myrtle Beach, the, the Myrtle Beach connector, and mm -hmm. uh, Charleston, and, and, and Greenville. And, but but that's not the whole state. We have counties out here who have roads with holes in them. They have water and sewer systems that are crumbling. We, we have to do something with that. We, we, and if it's a, you, you have well, how to How do we go about, how we go about doing that? Aren't the, the roads technically are part of the federal, I mean, there are federal roads and then there are state roads. Right, right. And, and, uh, um, you know, there have been debates over whether or not we should uh, uh, set up a toll road on the interstates coming into South Carolina. Other states do it. Mm -hmm. um, been a question on that. Uh, we have to find a funding mechanism out there that's stable that we can start doing something to, uh, to, to, to address these needs. We know they're there. They're not going away. They're only sure. going to get worse. So, so we need to do something. We do need to do something, absolutely. In fact, I, I understand right now there aren't even really any big road projects uh, for the DOT right now because of their funding issues and what happened last year. And what we have to remember, too, whenever we're not building roads, we're not employing people of our state. We're not employing workers that, 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 that build roads. We're, um, we're not employing people that are going to pay taxes that, that are going to be on the uh, tax rolls. We, we, it, it, it's a trickle effect. I mean, it, it, it goes from if you're not building roads and you're not using the uh, South Carolina builders, you're not using the South Carolina workers, you're not using South Carolina materials, you're not, it it's, just, on it's, on. it's a vicious cycle. Absolutely. So we're looking at, uh, so in government, so, so on a tax system, really, you know, uh, before the last election, I think it was being talked about, it was a hose that had been repaired so many times that it needed to be thrown out and started over. Your feeling? I, I would like to see, and, and, and I'm not being facetious with this, but I would like to see if, if the, the next study committee or the next commission that looks at tax, ta uh, the tax structure, mm -hmm take the studies that have been done over the last 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. see what was said in those studies, 
use those studies to go by. The work's already been done. It's just a matter of going back and reviewing those studies. Sure. Taking the best out of that, and then let's really get to, to, to some tax uh, re, uh, restructuring. Sure. Well, you know, they've done some things like on uh, the unemployment. They've, they've taken in up the dollars instead. It used to be, I think, 7500 Now it's up to 10000 I mean, they're upping those things. They were able to make decisions on that that cost employers, and rightfully so. It was very cheap. It was very cheap. I don't have any problem with that. But they were able to make those decisions and get that done. It would seem that we could do the same type of thing on our state taxes. Um, I believe the it, it, it's too easy to um, to say I'm not going to vote to raise any taxes. I'm not going to vote to for, for any new taxes. Well, the fact of the matter is we have taxes out there that we can look at. And we can determine what is working and what isn't working. Mm -hmm. We can we can determine what tax is a drag on the economy, which tax is not a drag on the economy. We going we if we want to bring in business, we're gonna to have to make investments in our infrastructure. Sure. They're not gonna bring if 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 uh, I'll use Boeing as as an example. Boeing wants to come in to a well of uh, a, 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 a state where we have infrastructure to allow them to be built, a workforce that's trained. Our, our tech schools do a wonderful job. Our okay. higher education schools do, do do a wonderful job. That's the stuff that's going to bring in the uh, uh, employers that's going to build this thing. Now, what do you feel about the port? What do you feel about the port? A lot of people don't, uh, don't understand, although I think I've talked about it enough, that they should understand that it affects the upper state as well as, as Charleston. When, when, when BMW, located in South Carolina, one of the one 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 of the factors was the fact that you had the port of Charleston that could handle their um, their their imports and exports. imports and exports and then and uh, and and because of that, it was one of the deciding factors uh, for, for for BMW to uh, locate in South Carolina. The BMW came then also we had spin off industries exactly. that uh, came in. The port of Charleston, you know, I know this thing with with Jasper and and, and, and George now. But I'm just talking specifically about the Port of Charleston. The facilities are there. It, it has got to be maintained. Its competitiveness has got to be maintained. We have got to put money into it in order to help it maintain its competitiveness. But um, you, 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 you're exactly right. It's not a Charleston project. Mm -hmm. it, is an up, it, it is a state of South Carolina project. Yes. And it's going to, uh, it, it's an economic, it's one of our economic engines, just as Myrtle Beach is an economic engine for, for, for tourism. Mm -hmm. The Port of Charleston is an economic engine for economic development in this state. Absolutely. Now, of course, voter ID, that's been a big issue, uh, of course, and I, there is a uh, case, I think, that's going up against the Supreme Court on the voter ID. South Carolina state seems to spend a lot of time in trouble with the Justice Department. They keep checking us out. Now, supposedly there were 992 people or something along that line that, were, uh, that voted that were already dead. Voter ID, uh, there's been a, a big division on voter ID. As, as a representative to the state, where do you fall on, on that? I, I, 992 dead people voting in a state this size. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I would like to see the, uh, I, I'd like to see the investigation that was done. I'd like to see the person who, uh, to, to, to verify that. Well, do that, you think that people should have to have a, a driver's license or a state issued ID? I mean, to me, it doesn't seem like we can do anything. I can't do anything in this state without some type of picture ID to prove who I am. You, and, and, and with the, uh, uh, Voter card. I mean that that voter ID, a driver's license would be fine. I mean that's I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Or whatever makes it easiest. Sure. I, we don't want to make it harder for people to vote. I think the big issue was that elderly people would not have picture IDs. Well, if they have a driver's license, they do. If they don't have a driver's license, I do believe that they can get a picture ID. They 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 can. I I I just uh, anything that makes it harder to vote. I have a problem with it. I have to so do you consider? Well, do you think that having a picture ID in order to have to vote? Do you think that makes it more difficult? If there's an invalid out there that can get out to a uh, can make it to a DMV and have a picture taken, or uh, I think the governor offered to, to go to their them. house and take, take them, them or whatever. Sure. You know, I mean that that's the simplistic uh, uh, approaches. But um, I don't know how much money we spent on a problem that is 
I don't know what the magnitude of the problem is. is what I'm saying. I don't really see it as a problem. I think that having a picture ID is not that big a right, big right. a big a deal. Right. But a, a lot it seems to that's one of those issues I think where you could have reached across the oh, across yeah, the work, aisle and work that out. Work that one out. It it, uh, it 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 shouldn't be political because we all want people to vote. Exactly. You know, and it, and and that's one of those issues that should be a, a bipartisan issue. Exactly. You know, but but it turned into a very partisan issue. Exactly. Accusations thrown across you know, both sides of the aisle. Um, I, I just, uh, uh, you know, I, again, I'd say that that's a, uh, an, an issue that's more fabricated than is really affecting me and the quality Absolutely. of my life. Now, you, of course, worked for a long time for John Drummond, Senator John Drummond. Yes, ma'am, I did. What, what, was, what did you, while you were working for him, what did you take away from the way he worked? He was very dedicated to the people back home. He always was the, you know, he called himself that senator from 96, that little senator from 96. Um, the door was always open. Well, he was a little guy. <laughs> <He was. laughs> okay, okay, I get it now. All right, go and, ahead. And he realized that. And, uh, but, but our door was always open. Mm -hmm. We didn't see Democrats or Republicans coming into the office. We didn't see black and white coming into the office. We saw people coming into the office that wanted to talk with, uh, had, had an issue they wanted to discuss. Um, he was a, uh, you know, he was called a renegade back in the uh, early '80s. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was uh, uh, Arthur Ravenel, former late Senator Arthur Ravenel from Charleston. Uh, there were five Republicans in Columbia, and he used to refer to when John Drummond got with him. He said, "Well, we've got a Republican six pack." John Drummond was a very fiscal conservative person. John Drummond had, uh, uh, you know, was raised in a time of the Depression, and he saw men die in World War II that. They they weren't Democrat or Republican. They weren't black or white. And he said that many a time. Um, they bled like everybody else. They bled like everybody else. And they were yeah. fighting, under, fighting for the same flag and principles that that that, that we all value. Mm -hmm. um, he was never he he would he would never draw he he'd draw a line in the sand, but he'd try to reach across to uh, resolve an issue. Once one instance is the uh, a senator. Him and the senator had a very very, it is a very hot disagreement, and the senator came in and told Senator Drummond, uh, "Senator, I, I, uh, I don't want to be your enemy." And Senator Drummond looked at him. He said, uh, "No, you do not want to be my enemy." <laughs> and he looked at him like Senator Drummond was threatening him. Senator Drummond said, "No." He said, "What do you mean by that, Senator?" He said, "Cause you know what I do to my enemies. I make them my friends." And I thought that's what we all need to sit back and realize sometime. We the, politics is, is the art of addition, not subtraction. You want to add as many friends as you possibly can. And you want to keep your friends. You don't want to and you, enemies are something you don't want to add. Now there are times that you will have to be on the opposite side of somebody and you can't compromise with them. But but, but there's always that talking. Mm -hmm. you keep, as long as you're talking and looking at each other and, and laughing and smiling then you don't have time to pull that knife out and stuff it, shove it between the guy's ribs. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, so you 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 thought that he was a good negotiator then? I think he's a good negotiator. I think he was a good uh, 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 conciliator. I think he was uh, there. I, I can't tell you how many times that uh, he'd say, uh, "Bob, call up Senator so and so and so and so and so and so. Let's get down here in the office. We need to talk this thing out." Um, or, or 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 go up to the President Pro Tem's office and say. You know, look, guys, we 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 got to work this thing out. We can't keep 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 going like this. Um, he was. Uh, and was he, he successful in resolving things that way? Very, uh, I I would say uh, his batting average was pretty high. It was out of the park. I mean, he was a very good uh, person, and and not just with the Senate, but with the House. Right. And also, he worked. Uh, uh, Governor Campbell was was one of his. Uh, Favorite governors. He was one of his heroes, and and and, and Governor Campbell. Uh, the last time Senator Drummond ran, Governor Campbell endorsed Senator Drummond. Oh, not the last time. I, mean, I think it was in 1998. Uh, Governor Campbell endorsed Senator Drummond, um, and there was a uh, some some anger among the certain elements saying that you know well, he can't he he didn't endorse John Drummond. He's a Democrat, and you know Governor Campbell said I will endorse anybody that I want to, and John Drummond's one of my best friends and supporters in in, in Columbia. Um, you you reach out. He he. One 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 thing that I observed is 
He reached down. He wanted to talk. He wanted to work with you. And he wanted to see success. And he wanted everybody to share in it. He never ran from the blame. But he wanted the people, to, everybody to share in, in, in success. Well, he, I mean, he certainly is an icon in in our community and has been for so many years. Now, when you talk about economic development, we're going to run out of time here, but when you talk about economic development, what type of things, what type of industry particularly do you think this area needs? I'm always concerned, I'll just tell you my opinion, I'm always concerned about that 45 to 60-ish year old person who uh, worked in the mills, the mills are gone, and they've had a really tough time finding that niche where they can get back and get re-educated. Re-education is out there, but to find a job that suits them. And I think that's one of the areas that we're lacking in. And and, and I would agree with you. I'd like to see uh, in, industry come in that, that's coming in because they want to be here. You know, Fuji, when, when Fuji came in, uh, Senator Drummond was, well, was involved in that. And, and one of the interesting aspects of of, of our community that attracted Fuji was they came during the Festival of Flowers. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, they were so impressed in a community that would take so much pride in its appearance that they felt that's the place that they would, that they would want to be. Um, I'd, like, I'd, I'd like to see the uh, uh, in industry come in that, 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 that pays good wages. That, that, that uh, if, if it's necessary for our tech system, to our tech schools to come in and assist them with training these workers. You know, the state should be willing to step up to the plate. Um, I, also I haven't seen any problem as far as the tech schools being mm -hmm. able to do that. They've done that just up there in Simpsonville. Piedmont Tech has, and they have a lot of things going. And and uh, that's but so you think we need more manufacturing type jobs coming? At this in point, and I, I I believe we that, that, that we do need more manufacturing uh, type jobs. I think that and, and and going back to our education system, I think that the uh, uh, our, our technical colleges do a wonderful job. I think our higher education needs to get in, you know, needs to get in, in, involved in, um, uh, re, uh, in recruitment. Sure. So um, there is a lot to be done in this area. Um, one of the things you had down that you did want to uh, talk about was, uh, and I'd be interested in talking about this one, kind of going to have to be short, but lack of communication between county and Columbia. It's the uh, one, one thing that I learned in, in, in Columbia is that all wisdom does not emanate from Columbia. And there's really? this, the, <laughs> there's this, there's this, you, I don't know whether it is, is, it happens before you get there or, you know, they, they call, some people call it Potomac fever. Mm -hmm. When you go to Washington, you forget about people back home. Right. Yeah. Uh, why, uh, uh, Columbia being the seat for the uh, government, being the seat for the agencies out here who uh, have their county agencies, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, they need to get out of Columbia. If, if you're a department head in Columbia for DSS, you need to come out here and visit uh, McCormick or Greenwood, uh, Abbeville. You need to come out here and see these counties, how they're trying to function right. out here, rather than you sitting in Columbia in a nice, comfortable office and not not, not realize what's going on. If you're a probation uh, partner and a, a probation agent in, in, in Columbia, you're over the Department of Probation, come out here and see how our guys are trying to work, what they're trying to accomplish with very minimal resources, you know, trying to supervise uh, 200 and something uh, in uh, a probation or to parolees, that's an impossible task. But they have their resources in, in Columbia. Um, when you start talking about uh, local taxes, we need to talk to the school teachers. We need to talk to the teachers. We need to talk to the principals. We need to find out exactly what works and what doesn't work. One size doesn't fit all in education. One size doesn't fit all in, in government. We need to go ahead and, and trust the people on the local level, the, those closest to the people, to do the right thing. If they don't do the right thing, let's trust the people to vote them out of office. But we need to be there to listen to them and see what we can do to help them. Absolutely. Well, we are here with Robert Merritt. He is running for District 13. That's right. I am Ann Eller right here on WCRS. Listen, it certainly has been great having you here today. It's been wonderful being with you. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, having you back again as we get closer to the uh, November election. 
By the way, are you going out to the stump here at I 7 will, o'clock? I, I will be there. I'm looking forward to it. That's right. Now, that, of course, is out on Calhoun Road at the uh, Rental Center. Everybody's been invited, so uh, Robert says he's going to be there. I know a lot of other people there. This is your opportunity to get out there and get to know the candidates. Please do it. We will be posting a, his video and audio on our website, so you'll be able to check that out. This is WCRS right here in Greenwood. Again, we are having some satellite difficulties. Hope to get them resolved soon. This is killing me, folks. But if we're off the air for a while, we'll be back on, and I'll be here in the morning. So don't you go away. This is WCRS right here in Greenwood. Bye-bye, everybody.